I didn't play. Um, it may have looked like it in previous weeks, but I didn't. We are in Colossians. We are in chapter 2, this series of His All or Everything. Uh, I, I got to tell you, like even, even this week as I was looking at this next passage, and I can't seem to get past the incredible depth of what this is talking about. It's so simple. It's so basic. Um, each verse almost stands alone as a, a, not just a message or a sermon, but as a series of messages for life. Because we're talking about the basic understanding of who we are in Christ, who he is in us, our freedom because we are forgiven, our freedom from the law. And these are not just things that Paul wrote to that church 2,000 years ago for their benefit. These are things that today are as relevant to us as they were to them back then because these are still the issues of the day. Who are we? What's our purpose? What are we doing here? Where's God in all of this? And we live in a world that has been infected and infested with sin. And you see the impact all around you. You see the consequences, the result of the, the, the horrible, the horrible effect of sin all around. And the church oftentimes is scratching its head. What do we do about all of this? And religion comes in, as it did back then, to offer certain rem religion. That there's unique and specific and elite ways to get to God. No, the only way to God is through Christ, was his point. It's Jesus plus nothing. And that's the book of Colossians. And so it's, it's the preeminence of Jesus where the church often has him as prominent. He's part of the message in many churches. The reality is Jesus is the only message of the gospel. He's it. It's Jesus. He is, as one popular song says, our all in all. It's all about him. So we saw last week in verse 13, it says, when, uh, chapter 2, when you were dead <clears throat> in your trans transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together. If you receive Jesus instantly at that moment, you didn't just get a ticket to heaven. What you got was life here on earth. I've come that you might have life and have it to the fullest. This is the heart of God for us. This is what he's all about. That Not that you just go to heaven one day, not just that you're destination changes, but that your identity, your, the dynamic of your life changes. He is your life. If you've received Jesus, this is true for you. He made you alive. And not only that, look what it goes on to say, with him and having forgiven us all our transgressions. That's kind of where we settled last week. But I got to be honest with you, when it comes to this kind of forgiveness, it's anything but settled in the church. We are still really prone to sin management as Christians, to identifying sin, figuring out sin, focusing on sin, trying to eliminate sin, get rid of sin, take sin away, get, get out of our lives. Haven't you struggled with the idea of managing sin? It's ridiculously hard because it's not our job. Our job is to recognize the only one who could take away sin. And that that one lives in us by faith. And we no longer set our focus on how to overcome or find victory over sin. We set our focus on the one who did it for us. That's the gospel. Having been forgiven all our sins. Each of these verses, they're not difficult to understand. How difficult is to understand that you received Jesus, you were made alive. That's not difficult to understand. It's hard to believe at times. It can be hard to believe with the onslaught of the world that we live in, the emotions that we feel, the, 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 the past that we've lived. It can be hard to believe that I'm really united to Jesus. Where is he? I don't see him with physical eyes. I have to see him with the eyes of faith. Believe that what he's saying is true. He did what he said. He came and he inhabited us by faith. Don't have to see it. It's not hard to understand. It can be difficult to believe in a, si a sight and seen and sound world. It's not hard to understand. He's forgiven all your sins. 
Is that hard to understand or comprehend? No, we, we, could, we could graph that equation. He's forgiven them all. Not hard to understand. It's hard to believe at times, isn't it? Would you agree with me that it's hard to believe that, that God would forgive all our sins? God, do you not know? Do you not know about this one? <laughs> Do you remember that one? I mean, the people that I did it to, they haven't forgiven me yet. Can you really forgive? God, you, when you say all, oh, you mean even the ones I haven't committed yet? You forgive the ones that haven't happened yet? This is not hard to understand in terms of hearing it. It's hard to believe at times. That we, to say, God, you're telling the truth. You've been made alive. You've been forgiven. You, it, goes, it goes even further. We saw this last week. We're not going to look at it today. Ephesians 2, 6 says, you have been raised and seated with Jesus. You are seated with him in the heavenly places right now. And I have no idea how we can be standing on earth and seated in heaven at the same time. But we are what well, some of you are seated on earth and seated in heaven at the same time. Do you see your unique and your new position in Jesus. It's a reality. We lay hold of it by faith. We see it through the eyes of faith. And then seated in Christ, at the right hand of the Father, in the heavenly places, how loved and accepted and forgiven are you right there? Whatever you're going through, whatever turmoil, whatever stress, whatever uh, issues you're going through here on earth, How okay are you seated in heaven at the right hand? I hear many Christians talking about their hope of, of, I hope that what I do outweighs the bad things I do, that the good I do outweighs the bad. I hope that at the end of the day, I've done enough where God will accept me. I hope at the end of the day, God will be pleased. Do you realize that game is over if you're in Christ? You're already seated. He's pleased with you. Let Let that ring in your brain for a second. The God of the universe who accepts nothing short of perfection, he's holy, he's righteous. If you're in Christ, he's pleased with you right now. You don't have to go do anything for that to happen, but everything you do now can be empowered by the truth that that has happened. See, we live very differently when we're trying to please somebody than when we know that we're pleasing to somebody. God is pleased with you. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. So when you do some things that are unpleasing to God, he won't leave. He doesn't pack his bags and wait till you're done. Move out and then move back in. God, you're not moving in and out of fellowship with God. You're united to him. You're secure in him. When you have those feelings that feel like you've blown it, you've forfeited it, that that there's no way that God could be okay with you anymore, let this verse tell you he's forgiven all. See, he's, he's rigged this thing. The gospel's rigged. Did you know that? By his favor, in your favor, the gospel is rigged. You can't mess this up. You don't have not far away from God. So many Christians, I wish I were closer to God. I, I just want to feel close to God. I want to get closer to God. I wish God weren't so far away. Where is he? Have you felt that way at times? We all feel that way at times. Let's admit that we feel that way at times. But let's confess that it's never that way at any time. You're not far away from God if you're in Christ. You're united. You're joined to Jesus. You can feel far away, but guess what? That feeling is to escort you because it's so outlandishly false in terms of the truth. It's such a lie to what the truth is. That feeling should just really make you look straight at Jesus and go, wait a minute. Either you're telling the truth or the feeling's telling the truth, and now I have a choice to make. Do I go by feel or by faith? It's When we talk about this word forgiven... 
here in Colossians 2.13. This is not your typical word used throughout the New Testament. We talked about that last week. The typical word used 163 times in the New Testament is the word afiame, which literally means to release, to send away, to let go, to pardon. 163 times that word is used. This word for forgiven is charizomai. It's used only 23 times in the New Testament. And while they both mean forgiven, this word charizomai has the root in it of charis. It's the word for grace. Paul is here in this passage getting us to focus not on what's been released or pardoned so much. Of course, it includes that. Forgiveness always does. But actually, it's to get us to have a mindset of the God of grace who pardoned us. Charizomai. It emphasizes the kindness and goodness of God in forgiving us. And he's done it completely. It's why we looked at this passage last week. This is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. Look what it says. In him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. Why? That's what we have. We have in Christ the forgiveness of our trespasses by the blood of Jesus. But why do we have it? What was the motivation for this? Look what it says. According to his riches of his grace. By nature, God is a forgiver. It's who he is. It's what he's about. It's according to his grace. This, this levels the playing field for all of us who struggle with a God who could forgive us no matter what. He's a forgiver by nature. Hear this. Regardless of the size of your offense. He's a forgiver by nature regardless of the severity of your offense. He's a forgiver by nature regardless, I need this one, of the frequency of your offense. He's a forgiver by nature, regardless of the nature of your offense. He is a forgiver by nature, regardless of the amount of your offenses. Are you getting the picture? He has forgiven you what? All. That all is nothing for God, but it's everything for us. Why? Because he loves you. It's according to his riches. It's his goodness and his kindness. And he says, I don't want any of those, these sins trailing you. I don't want any of these sins, like you being tied to it and it, it upsetting you. God wants us to be rid of sins so that we can fix our eyes on him who is life. We are not to be sin managers. We're, forgiving all, we're forgiven for all. Even if we did it willfully, all of it's willful, by the way. What if we did it repeatedly? We're forgiven all. What if we did it, but we promised never to do it again? Have you ever done that? Have you ever, you ever dealt with God? You ever made a promise to God? You, you, have you ever realized we're not great at promise keeping? There's one promise keeper. It's what Hebrews 6 says. It, it, says, it says, look, because God could swear by no greater person. He didn't make a covenant with you and me. Did you know that? This new covenant or this covenant that's new, we see it in that covenant with Abraham. This covenant was not made with you and me where God says, I promise to do this if you promise to do that. That's the old covenant. This new covenant, Hebrews 6 says, because God could swear by no one greater, he promised thus with himself and with these two unshakable things, God and his promise we, the recipients of that promise, we have an anchor for our soul. You can anchor your soul to the promise God made with himself that you are completely righteous and forgiven. It's such powerfully good news. It's so good. We're going to look at the verse again. He's forgiven us. This charizomai is bigger than all your sins. We said last week, he's forgiven all. We, we, I, I shared with you, Catherine, my wife, has forgiven me all my sins so far. Over the course of 30-something years, 
I haven't added those up. I'm sure she has. And she has forgiven them all so far. But she's only forgiven the all she knows. But God knows all. He knows everything. He knows past, present, and future. He's forgiven the all that he knows, and he knows everything. It's critical to understand that. This is a huge difference, a huge distinction from what we as humanity are used to, from what Israel as humanity was used to in the Old Covenant. See, that Old Covenant forgiveness is ongoing. You realize they had to sacrifice year after year. They had to keep offering sacrifices. But, but that's the purpose of the law, that it would be a perpetual and continual reminder, recognition, bring an awareness that something is wrong. The purpose of the law is not to tell you how to live. It's to tell you what's wrong. It's not the answer to our sin problem. It's, the, it's to bring awareness of our sin problem, that we need a Savior we're going to see more of this in the next verse because actually what Paul is going to lead us to after telling us we're united to Jesus and we're forgiven, the law is a shadow. It's, a, it's not the substance. It's not the reality. Jesus is that. This is what Hebrews 10 is all about. Look, look at this passage. It's so good that I, I, I was sitting at my computer last night just in, in, in finishing up or starting or whatever, preparing for today, and I was, I was looking at this, and I literally paused and went, it, I, I, listen, I have taught on this passage. I have read this passage. I, I, I have known this passage. The way it hit me last night, I'm thinking, there's no way to do justice to this idea. Look what he says. For the law, since it has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very form of things, can never, by the same sacrifices which they offer continually year by year, Make perfect those who draw near. Do you see that the, ob, the, what God is after is the making perfect of those who, who draw near? Think about it. The law can't do that. Verse 2, otherwise would they not have ceased to be offered. Meaning, if the law, if those animal sacrifices could accomplish what was needed, complete forgiveness then you would only have to have done it once because you would never need to do it again. But they did it continually. He says, would they not have ceased to be offered because the worshipers, that's you and me, that's Israel, having once been cleansed, would no longer have had consciousness of sins. Oh my gosh. But in those sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins year by year. For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Do you see what he's saying? God does not want his people to have a, an awareness, a consciousness of sin. And we are inundated in religious teaching with sin consciousness. And, and, and the whole sacrificial system was a foreshadowing. It wasn't the substance. It was the symbol. It was the, it was the foreshadowing to lead us to, hey, there's a problem and we need a solution. And it doesn't come in what I can offer no matter how many times I offer it, the solution that comes for our problem is in what God offers for me. Do you see it? You can offer your lamb for your sins all day long. You'll have to keep doing it is the point. But when God offers his lamb for your sins, it's over. It's over. One time and it's done. It's permanent. See, the Old Testament was a covering of sins. It's, it's the word kofar. It literally means to cover sins. That's what was happening in the, the blood of bulls and goats. It was a, they, they, they referenced this by sprinkling the blood on the mercy seat. It covered over sins as though God would look past them. Remember, Passover, as though God would look past sins until the next one. And then you got to have a remedy for that another sacrifice. It's just a temporary covering. What Jesus did is not a temporary covering. It's greater than the Old Testament word kofar for atonement. What Jesus did was take away your sins. He washed them away. They no longer exist for you. They are removed as far as the east is from the west, and we are. he will remember them no more. That's not a covering. You can't slip the cover back and find your sins again. He took them away and he nailed them to the cross and they are never to haunt you again. 
forgiven. That's what it means. And it's once for all, and it's through the sacrifice of himself. Look at this verse. It's, it's a little further down in the same passage of Hebrews. But my word, not this one. Let's see, hold on. This one. Look at it. This is 10, verse 11 and 12. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices. So the priest, that Levitical priest, he would stand in the tabernacle or the temple, and he was a mediator between God and man, and he was offering the sacrifices that you would bring, and he would offer them unto God, and he stood daily. You can go look at the the furniture in the tabernacle or in the temple. You won't find a a chair because it was symbolic that the priest's work as he mediated between God and man was never done because sin was ever present. So he stands daily in the temple offering the sacrifices which can never take away sin. Do you see the futility of this? But, verse 12, He, Jesus, having offered one sacrifice for sins for all time. This is more than just the the one sin, the, the, the sins of the one person who brings the lamb. This is the sins for all time. And look what it says. He offered once, and he what? Not stands daily. He sat down. What does it tell you? He sat where? At the right hand of God. We already saw Ephesians 2. You're seated with Christ at the right hand of God. When it comes to your sins, sit down. It's over. It's done. Your job is not to try and go out there and avoid sin or stop sinning. Your job is to trust Jesus. You watch the spiritually organic outflow of the perception of the the mind set on him rather than set on sin. It's beautiful. It's finished. The idea of standing means there's no rest. It's incomplete. It's going to keep going. It'll never end. The idea of sitting is it's done. You can rest. Well, Tim, I feel guilty at times. Okay, you feel guilty, but you're forgiven. Tim, I feel ashamed at times. Okay, you feel ashamed. It's not good to feel that, but okay, you feel ashamed, but you're forgiven. Do you see, we, we, we by faith believe him. This changes everything in how we see God and how we relate to him. This changes everything in how we see ourselves and relate to ourselves. When we know we are forgiven, we can stop confessing to get forgiven and start confessing that we are forgiven. Oh, what a novel idea in the church. Let's get people off the religious railroad track of religious railroad track. That's hard to say. Let's get people off this religious track of having to maintain and confess their sins daily in order for God to forgive them. It's too late to do that. Confession means to agree with God. We've already seen we're completely forgiven. We should be agreeing with God that we are forgiven. That's your confession. That's what that means. In fact, I I didn't put it on here, but, but... But the rest of Hebrews, let let me read you where, where the author of Hebrews concludes. This is chapter 10, verses 19 through 25. So after we see that every priest stands daily, but Jesus sat down, he then goes on to say, he quotes an Old Testament scripture, and he says, "Um, I will remember your sins no more. And this is his conclusion. How do we know it's the conclusion? Because verse 19 starts with, therefore, because of all this, because of what you're reading here, listen to what he says in Hebrews 10, 19. Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, if you're cleansed, you can enter the holy place because only cleansed people can do so. Only only those who have been effectively cleansed of their unrighteousness and have been made righteous, right? Grace is more than just the subtraction of your sins. It's the addition of his righteousness. And only those people can enter with confidence, he says, by a new and living way. That's Jesus, by the way. Not by the old way of the letter. By a new way, a new and living way of the Spirit in which he had the house of God. Let us draw near with a sincere heart. And let us, listen to this, let us hold fast the confession of our hope. That's our confession, that we hope that this is true. And that's not the hope of wishful thinking. That's the, our hope. Without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Your hope is not in your ability to do anything. It's in God's faithfulness to his promise that he made with himself for you. That's the new covenant. 
And let us consider, look how it affects. So it changes how we think about ourselves, of and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Do you see all the more as you see the day drawing near? Is this the idea of growing in this, that we are growing together? When it says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, I used to hear, you're supposed to go to church. That's much richer than that idea. This is the church, is those who in Christ assemble together. You're the church. It's a body, not a building. And you are the church. And he says, we should come together. When we understand our hope, the confession of our hope, of his promise to us, you can't keep us apart. That's his point. Confession has become this Daily practice for believers of bondage, where we throw our sins before the God. We, it's the word homologeo. It means to say the same thing as God. And they think if we continue to tell people that all of their sins are forgiven, if they're in Christ, if, they're, if all of their sins are forgiven, then they're going to go run amok into sin. And, and, but it's, it's not just that your sins are forgiven. What's the rest of this? It's not just a subtraction of your sins. That's not the gospel. That's part of the gospel. The other part of the gospel is it's an infusion of his righteousness to you where you get a new heart sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. You know what that means? You know what the new heart for the believer means? You don't want to sin. You don't have to to burden the believer with with the false motivations of fear and condemnation, shame and guilt to keep them from sinning. It never worked. It doesn't work. It's the result of sin. It's not keeping anybody from sin. The way you motivate the believers, teach the truth. It's God's love. It's his life in you that will compel you, that will spur you on to love and good deeds. It's the outflow of the life that's inflowed into you. All this idea of being that we're that we're still kind of sin managing, it just keeps us hiding. You know, there's more ink in Scripture that says confess your sins one to another than there is confess your sins to God. Do you know why? God wants us living in vulnerability and transparency with each other. God doesn't want anybody on the the hook of a false idea that just because we are forgiven means we still don't mess up at times. James says we stumble in many ways. We're growing we're not, we're not fully arrived in terms of full maturity yet. We're growing in it. We still stumble along the way. But if we deny that stumble or we hide that stumble from others, then they can't relate to it. And then we have no compassion. There's no interconnectedness because we're hiding. And this is, this is the stuff that started in the garden. As soon as Adam and Eve sinned, they hid And the only way to bring people out of hiding is to do away with sin and tell them, hey, let's come together and let's be honest. Let's be honest with each other. What I've done, if you really knew what I struggled with, you would reject me. This is not only imposed onto others what we think, it's imposed onto our idea of God. If God really knew, if, if he really understood, and he does, so he does reject me. You know how many Christians, those... Children of God think that God can't stand them or at best is mildly disgusted with them. Do you know how many in the church believe that? And it's tragic. And it comes from these religious messages and it comes from the lie of the enemy that purports so. It's not true. It's from all of that. Now we can get free of shame and guilt and condemnation, that stuff that has so wickedly kept us hiding. Now, only now, can we be fully known. Fully, you're perfect and you're righteous. Of course. That's what that life in you has done. From a, from a walking standpoint, in terms of what I express, pointed with your walk. Let me say it again, because I think it's hard to believe. God is not disappointed with your walk. You may be. You may get frustrated by it. You may think you should have licked this already. You may think you should have gotten past this already. You may think you should never have done this again. But God didn't expect that. You know why? 
He's in this habit of knowing all. And he knew on Sunday what you didn't expect you would do on Thursday. Now, what about those things that we do that disappoint God? I mean, the best illustration I can come up with is my own kids. They do things, uh, I say disappoint God, that, that, that grieve God, actually, is the, is the biblical term. What about those things that my kids do that I can get disappointed because I'm not God? Uh, what about the things that we do that grieve God? Well, with my kids, they've done some things that can grieve me. They would tell you, I won't let them, that I've done things that grieve them. But we don't have that much time. What about when they do something that grieves me? Can you relate to this idea? And, 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 and think of God with you. That, that when they do things that grieve me, I am never unpleased with who they are. I still love them. I accept them. And the reason what they do grieves me is because whatever they did that grieves me doesn't line up with the fullness of my heart for them. I want better. I want them to experience the freedom that comes from living like who we are, not just out of how we feel at any given moment. And so it is with God, accepted, because he has forgiven all powerful this because this next passage is so rich look what he says as if forgiving us all wasn't enough look what he says having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us which was hostile to us and he has taken it out of the way having nailed it to the cross do you know what he's referencing here the certificate of debt Consisting of decrees. That, that word decrees is literally dogma. The, the, that, that word for canceling out is an incredibly rich word. Exalifo. I, can't, I don't know if I can say it right, but that's the word. Exalifo. You know what? This is the same word that's used in Revelation where it says that he will not exalifo. He will not blot out your sin. Your, 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 I'm sorry. He will not blot out your name from the book of life. Same word. It's used later in Revelation when he says, he will wipe away every tear. Exalifo. He will blot out. He will take away every tear. He will cancel them out. Do you see the richness of this word? He will never blot out your name from the book of life, but he will blot out every tear. Here he says he has blotted out this debt of, that consists of decrees against us. He's talking about the law. And look what he says. The law is hostile to us. Wait a minute. Why would God give a law that's hostile to us? Why would God give a law that would need to be canceled out? Why would God give a law, a dogmatic set of decrees, if that's going to just be canceled it's because God knows the purpose of the law. This is what we're going to look at in, in the next week or so. But, but when we talk about the law, so many believers think that the purpose of the law is God's mandate for how we are to live. Here are the Ten Commandments. Follow them. Abide by them. Right? And what's the church's response to this? How well is that working for you? You know what the very first one is? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, Lo right? How you doing with the first one? Well, you may say, well, I love God. No, with all your heart, so nothing left over for LSU football, sushi, you name it, your dog, the kids. Like, do you see that the, the Ten Commandments God never gave them as a means for us to live by. He gave them as a recognition of why we were dead, that we were dead. I hear people say, well, we are, we are free from this, this cancel, the, that debt. It means the ceremonial or civil aspects of the law, not the 10, not the moral law. I mean, those are good. They're even repeated in the New Testament. He does not expect you to abide by that. 
Because that wasn't the purpose that it was given. We're going to look at that next week. Why was the law given? It was given as a diagnostic tool, not as a remedy. When I was in college, I don't do this anymore just because it's not convenient. It's just easier to take it somewhere. But when I was in college, I, I wanted to save money, so I learned to change the oil in my car. I'm not handy or mechanically inclined in the least, like literally in the least. I have to read instructions when it comes to changing a light bulb. But I wanted to save money, so I started learning how to change my oil. And the first thing I was told was you got to pull the dipstick out and check the oil level, right? That's a diagnostic tool. How much oil is in the car? The dipstick tells you that. It's what it's designed to do. What the dipstick is not designed to do is change the oil in your car, right? We are using the law oftentimes as not a diagnostic tool, but as the tool to change our lives, to, to get us to live differently. We're being dipsticks when we do that. It doesn't work. The law is not a, di is not a, a remedy. It's a diagnosis. Romans 3, no flesh will be justified by following the law, but sin will be revealed. Romans 5, we'll see these next week. The law was added that the transgression would increase. God, hear this, this is, it may not be radical to you guys because you, you hear such, but it's radical to the Christian world who's, who's clamoring to have the Ten Commandments posted. Everywhere. Look, I'm, I'm, I'm not necessarily for or against that in a, in, in a sense of the world we live in. I'm, like, I'm not on that train so much, but I am against the idea that the believer thinks that the way they are to manage their life is by trying hard to follow the law. It doesn't work. The law was given so that the transgression might increase. God gave the law so that sin would be fully exposed. Paul says in Romans 7, if I had not known the law, I would not have known sin. And he says that when I, when I saw the commandment, sin became utterly sinful to me. The commandment reveals sin. God gave the law so that we would see our need of him. This freedom that comes from knowing not only am I united to Jesus, not only am I completely forgiven, but now the manner in which I am to live is not by the old way of trying really hard to follow a static and unloving set of commandments. I say unloving because in, in a real way, the law does not love you. Galatians 3 said it's a tutor. It leads us to Jesus. Guess what Jesus does? He loves you. It's why he doesn't leave the law in place for the believer. We're going to see next week, of course, Jesus says, I didn't come to what? Abolish the law. I came to fulfill it. But do you know what Jesus did? He fulfilled the law. Do you know what that does for the law in your life? It abolishes it as a dynamic of trying to live because we have a much better way. It's the way of faith where we don't try to live like God tells us. We trust God in living like he tells us. By knowing who he is, who we are in him, and saying thank you. Father, this morning we thank you for truth that sets us free. We thank you for the reality of this nuke our soul to you. This is our hope. This is what we are to confess. This is what has changed our life and brothers and sisters it changes how we see the world around us.